Right, so all the people who reminded me to record, thank you very much. And oh, we have more people joining. Right, um, welcome everybody to the first talk of 2023. Um, the speaker today, I think needs little introduction and is well known to everybody. Um, Wit has spoken to us before, is a lovely engaging speaker and I'm thoroughly looking forward to what he's got to say. Um, Brian Coleman, I think I spotted you joining. Brian, can you just confirm that you're, you're out there in the ether somewhere? Yes, I am. Fantastic, thank you very much. That is very reassuring and comforting. Um, Wit, can I invite you to take the floor and give us a presentation? Certainly. And happy new year to everybody. Yes. From Anchorage. Uh, I must not have tortured you guys too much. The last time you invited me back, um, I think the last presentation I made was on HARP. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about meteor trail reflections in uh, that I've received in the HF band. And these will all, all been observed uh, at Anchorage where I live. And um, it's uh, doing meteor trail reflection observations in the HF band is I think somewhat unique, but I'm not the only person that's doing that. I know that Stan Nelson in Roswell, New Mexico also uses uh, WWV and WWVH uh, transmitters here in the US for meteor trail work. So um, here's what I'm gonna, the topics that I'm going to cover, it'll take uh, uh, hopefully a little less than an hour. I, I don't wanna spill over too much. Uh, my presentation is similar to one I made at the 2021 SARA Eastern Conference. It was a um, an online or virtual conference. So uh, if you've seen this, then you can go off and have a whiskey or something. And uh, there's not a whole lot new uh, if you saw that, uh, the Sarah uh, presentation. Got some meteor fun facts to look at, um, the reflection concepts, and some of the considerations for observation at HF, which are, I, I think, uh, quite a bit different than observations at VHF and UHF. A little bit about my instrumentation, and then we'll get into the observations that I've, uh, that I've made. Uh, these are all from 2020, and um, uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the really interesting um, long duration and short duration echoes that I've seen. And then we've got some conclusions. And um, uh, I also have a list of web links and references at the end. Um, I know that's kind of hard to copy them off of a screen. You can maybe take a screenshot, or if you need them, I can uh, post, post them in the chat. So let's look at some of the fun facts. Um, I need to minimize the pictures of everybody here. Okay. So these uh, are what I call fun facts, but um, they're really estimates. Uh, I don't know how you'd be able to measure things like the number of meteors that uh, enter Earth's atmosphere every day. I don't know how you'd measure that. You'd have to do uh, maybe figure out how many hit the ground and then um, extrapolate from that. And boy, I'll tell you, that would be really risky. I don't think you'd come up with a real number that way, but um, people have attempted to do that. So these, uh, the meteor trail reflections that we're looking at um, come from dust grains that are left over from asteroids and comet, comets that have uh, come through the uh, solar system. And uh, they, they have a pretty tiny mass, a uh, tenth of a gram on down. Now that's that's pretty small. So it's just uh, they're just bits of dust. Um, there's supposed to be an equal mass distribution of each particle size. In other words, there's ten times more 
uh, 100th gram uh, meteors than there are one tenth gram meteors. Cool. So, so that's that's um, um, something that I got out of one of the references. Uh, again, I, I don't know how you'd be able to prove something like that, but their diameter is uh, uh, is from maybe two micrometers on up to two millimeters. Now, two millimeters is visible. Uh, if you, you you can hold that in your hand and see it. So um, so these are um, fairly big, I guess. Uh, but I I think the preponderance, the the large, very large majority of these uh, meteors is uh, in the micrometer range. Now I did a calculation. Roughly three hundred million of these will fit in a soup can. So. Um, uh, don't ask me how I did that. It was just a, <laughs> a, a wild guess. But their speed uh, ranges from 11 uh, kilometers per second up to 72. And, and those, those ranges are based on uh, the gravitational pull of the Earth as well as the gravitational pull of the sun. And um, there's an accompanying paper that I wrote, uh, a long paper that I wrote about all this stuff, and it shows you how to do those calculations. Now, another uh, fun fact or a fun estimate is that there's estimated to be 100 to 1,000 tons uh, of these meteors that enter the Earth's atmosphere each day, and about 5,000 tons fall to Earth. And um, again, the, I, I believe these are probably pretty good extrapolations. Uh, um, it, it could be like the um, the story of the Boy Scouts around the fire that it, as it gets passed around, it gets exaggerated. I, and I really don't know that. This, this picture over on the right is um, <clears throat> a magnified picture of a of grain uh, that was picked up in Antarctica as part of a, a project they had down there. And uh, you can, the, the dimension of this particular dust grain is 60 micrometers from left to right. So um, probably not visible by, by the human eye, but certainly under a microscope, uh, you can see it. So those are some of the things that uh, uh, are falling to earth every day. And when, when one of those comes down into the atmosphere, it collides with air molecules and, and atoms, and the kinetic energy is then converted to heat. And the heat is high enough where it vaporizes the surface atoms, and this is called ablation. And the ablated atoms are ionized. Uh, in other words, uh, electrons are stripped away from the atom and uh, become their own agent. Long, thin trails or columns of positive ions and free electrons typically are about 50 kilometers long. Now, that's a typical number. That doesn't mean they're all that long, or some could be longer, some could be shorter. Uh, it's a paraboloid-shaped trail, uh, somewhat like shown in the lower uh, right of this, of this slide. And where they cause, uh, where they start ablating, and uh, the free electrons then are are able to interact with radio waves, is in the 85 to 105 kilometer altitude range. Now, there's a lot that goes on at that altitude range. Uh, the aurora is active um, uh, at about 100 kilometers. The uh, E region of the ionosphere is in the neighborhood of 100 kilometers uh, above ground. So there's a lot of stuff that happens uh, at that altitude. And again, the speed ranges uh, from 11 to 72 kilometers per second. Now, the positive ions uh, have relatively high mass. They don't interact with radio waves necessarily. Uh, they're just too heavy. But now the free electrons that have been stripped away uh, by, the, uh, by the high heat um, they do readily interact with, with uh, at radio frequencies. So um, this means that they can cause reflection, reflect, refraction, and so on uh, of the radio waves as they come in. And this image that I stole from the uh, uh, address uh, just down below kind of shows uh, exactly what's going on here. 
We've got our neutral uh, air molecules shown in green, positive ions shown in red, and the electrons in blue. And uh, we have an incident radio wave that interacts with those electrons uh, mostly, and then is reflected or scattered uh, away. Um, and that's what we are actually receiving then is the scattered or the reflected radio wave. Now there's a couple mechanisms that are thought to be included in this process. And one is um, the, uh, the, the radio wave will actually penetrate the ionized trail of the, of the meteor and it's scattered coherently. And this implies that they're scattered in phase. Um, and this is a re-radiation mechanism uh, from the electrons. And the other is that the electron density uh, might be so great that the radio wave front can't penetrate the, the trail, but is reflected, and that's the specular reflection. Now, um, there's no clear cutoff between one or the other in terms of frequency, but I think that the, uh, the re-radiation is uh, effective at HF, at high frequencies, whereas the specular re reflection, uh, where there's actually a, um, uh, where the radio wave cannot penetrate the trail, I think that might be might apply to uh, VHF and UHF. So there's really two two mechanisms that are thought to take place here. Now the electron density in the trail is a lot higher than the surrounding ionosphere, and um, the range is from ten to the tenth, ten to the sixteenth electrons per meter of length. Now note that's a linear density. The uh, normally when we talk about electron density, like in the ionosphere, we're talking about uh, the number of electrons per cubic centimeter or per cubic meter. But in in uh, in terms of the meteor trail reflections, uh, we're talking about the number of electrons per meter of length of the trail itself. <clears throat> so the radio waves uh, more easily interact with the higher density trails. And uh, as I mentioned previously, there, there's probably a different scattering mechanism at HF than at, than at VHF. And I know you guys are, uh, have a meteor beacon project going uh, at 50 megahertz. So um, you're up in the VHF range for that. Now this schematic shows what's going on. We've got our uh, transmitter over here on the left, uh, on the lower left. And uh, it's beaming a uh, radio wave up into the sky. And at the altitude uh, where there are meteors starting to ionize, there's a reflection or a refraction. Um, and that uh, radio, the incident radio wave is then uh, redirected down to a receiver down on the uh, lower right here. Now, this, this is a two-dimensional two drawing, so it doesn't really show the total picture. Um, the transmitter, the reflection point up here in the uh, ionosphere, and the receiver are all in a common plane. And that plane may be tilted one way or the other. And um, the, uh, the angle of uh, reflection is equal for the incident as well as the reflect, refracted or reflected wave. Uh, and that's shown by uh, this, uh, these angles, these two angles shown here. So that's basically what's happening with the uh, meteor trail reflections or an echo. There's lots of names given to this and, and I'll, I use the echo and reflection interchangeably. Now, what this uh, ends up being is a bistatic radar. And uh, this means that the transmitter and receivers are static at, at a fixed location, uh, they're, and they're separated by some distance. Now, uh, the distance uh, can be any, any reasonable thing. In my case, the, the distance between the transmitter and receiver is on the order of 4,000 kilometers. So the transmitters that, that I'm receiving are the WWV uh, transmitters in, uh, that are in Colorado, and they're uh, almost exactly east of Anchorage. And then there's also WWVH uh, in Hawaii 
that's uh, 4,000 kilometers, almost exactly to the south of Anchorage. So those are the two stations that I um, that I am receiving. Now, when I receive uh, reflections, I don't know which of those two stations is uh, being reflected because uh, the um, uh, the audio and and the tones and so forth are not recognizable uh, in the reflections. So here's what I think is going on. Uh, we've got one transmitter uh, or a set of transmitters down here in Hawaii and uh, another set of transmitters over here in Colorado. And um, the radio waves then are traveling up toward Anchorage and um, uh, uh, shown here. And this yellow region is just a, uh, a wild guess that I've made as to where the reflection area is. So what I'm saying is that um, any meteors that drop down into, say, this area here, then there's a possibility of a reflection of, uh, of WWVH or WWV uh, transmissions into my receivers located at Anchorage. Now, the fact that these are um, uh, 4,000 kilometer paths, that means that they're, they're uh, almost assuredly has to be sky waves involved. So they're definitely not ground waves, they're just too far. So what I, I had, to, I thought about this for a long time and it occurred to me that um, as the radio waves from the transmitter are traveling uh, toward Anchorage, they're being reflected off the ionosphere and then they're bouncing off the ground. And at some point then, they uh, either come off the uh, ionosphere or come off the ground. And it's those reflections that I'm actually receiving at, at Anchorage. And I just gave this a, a name, a virtual transmitter, uh, that would be a, a reflection point on the ground <clears throat> or in the uh, ionosphere. And so that, that now that I've, I have a, a transmitter location nailed down, now I start to understand this a little bit better. Now, the propagation of, of these radio waves from the transmitters uh, to the ionosphere or to, to the meteor trails and then to my receiver um, use the ionosphere F or E regions or a combination of the two. There could be some ducting involved. Uh, there could be a, um, uh, a waveguide effect that's involved here. But uh, I don't know for sure. I, I just am guessing at that. But um, doing the calculations, the elevation angles um, are obviously going to depend on the number of hot hops and the height of the ionosphere. And um, for a, a, an F region at, the, at about 350 kilometer height, then uh, a one or two hop would uh, be an angle of 15 degrees. Now, uh, a one or two hop to Anchorage, I'm not sure um, if how often that occurs. There probably is more hops involved in reality. But one of the facts is, is that um, I don't normally see meteor trail reflections unless I'm also receiving a direct uh, transmission from, from the transmitter. So um, in other words, I'll, I'll see a trace on my uh, uh, recorder that uh, indicates that um, I'm receiving the transmission from the transmitter as well as a reflection uh, from the meteor trail. And I'll show you some, um, uh, some spectrograms of that here a little bit later. Now there's other considerations that come into play here. Uh, there's the daily motion of the earth as it rotates on its axis. And um, when I see the meteors almost um, without fail, they are in the early morning um, around, oh, uh, maybe six o'clock local time, uh, plus or minus all the way up to maybe nine o'clock local time. And uh, uh, that's when the chances are the best uh, of receiving meteor trail reflections because basically the earth is uh, uh, sweeping around, uh, rot uh, uh, 
passing through its orbit around the sun and it's sweeping up the meteors uh, basically out in front like the windshield of your car. Um, there's also meteors that overtake the Earth from the back, but I don't normally see anything um, in the PM. It's always in the AM. And then, of course, you got your seasonal effects. Uh, the Earth is, um, at least um, the northern hemisphere, is tilted toward the sun uh, at par for part of the year and then tilted away from the sun in the other part of the year. And so uh, you'll have uh, the effects of that as well on, uh, on a seasonal basis for receiving meteor trail reflections. Now, the other thing too, is that um, the propagation conditions uh, for a, a long path uh, like I have, a 4,000 kilometer path, is that there's uh, the propaga propagation conditions are gonna vary due to, due to the solar activity. And um, this means that there's a variation or should be a variation with the sunspot cycle. And also there's the, uh, uh, the gray line or so solar terminator that uh, comes into play uh, on the propagation as well. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the instrumentation that I have. Uh, this is just a block diagram of the setup I have here in Anchorage. And I use either the ICOM R8600 or the R75 receivers. And I have a, a, an eight element log periodic dipole on a rotator. Uh, the design range of that dipole or of the uh, log periodic is 18 to 32 megahertz, but it really works well um, down to much lower frequencies uh, than that, than the, the design range. So uh, the, um, uh, the log periodic then I usually have rotated so it points to the east uh, because that way I pick up HARP stuff as well as the WWV in uh, Colorado. This, uh, the antenna then is coupled through an eight port receiver multi-coupler to the receivers themselves. And then I have the audio outputs of these receivers connected through a six port analog audio mixer. And that allows me <clears throat> to use a single line in port on my PC uh, where I've mixed all the audios from, from my receivers into that one port. And then I'm running Argo software 24-7, uh, 365 on the PC. And there's a lot of other stuff that comes into play here to make all of this work. Of course, um, I have to have a local area network uh, UPS, I uh, have um, uh, GPS, NTP, Pi, NTP servers so that my timestamps on my PC are accurate. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, 13 and a half volt power supplies for the receivers. Um, the rotor controller is remotely located, so it op actually operates off the LAN. <clears throat> and uh, so if I want to move that rotator, I can uh, make the command from the PC up here in the right, and um, uh, the rotator then uh, is remotely located and will rotate the antenna. So that's basically what I have. Uh, here's a picture of the antenna from the ground on the left here, and you can see it's an eight element. Uh, it's about 13 millimeters above ground level, horizontally polarized, and there's a rotator up here uh, that you can hardly, hardly can see there at the top of the tower. And um, <clears throat> in the wintertime when it snows and there's no wind, uh, that log periodic picks up uh, quite a bit of snow. And you can see that the, uh, the elements are really, really get bent. And so far, there hasn't been any uh, permanent deformation of those elements. The receivers, I think you probably are all are familiar with the ICOM R75, a very popular general coverage receiver. Uh, they work really well. Uh, the, one of the problems with the R75 though is that um, they quit building them quite a few years ago now. And um, the electrolytic capacitors in them are drying out. And so uh, there's piles and piles of R75s around that don't work uh, because of that. 
The modern replacement for that is the R8600 down on the lower right. Uh, it has a little wider, actually quite a bit wider uh, frequency range. And um, it's really a capable receiver. I'm really happy with, with the uh, 8600. There's uh, some other stuff, the power supplies, the uh, network time protocol server, uh, uninterruptible power system, the, the uh, multi-coupler, and so on. Um, those all are important parts of the observatory here in Anchorage, and it, it couldn't operate with, uh, without them. I use Lenovo PCs exclusively. Um, the, the hardware reliability has been excellent, top of the line. Uh, they have real line in ports. Uh, they have real EIA 232 serial ports. Uh, you can add uh, different types of drives in them. Uh, I'm running Windows 10 Pro uh, on all of those. Uh, not so reliable. Uh, not that it doesn't work, it's just that those doggone updates are uh, hard to control. And I've been able to control most of it, but not all of it. And um, I have a note down here that these are good to minus 18 Celsius. Um, I have a remote observatory uh, at a place called Coho, and um, I'm using the same uh, PC, and it's not heated in the winter, and it can get down to minus 18, minus 23 Celsius uh, in, indoors in, inside the observatory. And these things continue to play, but I have had trouble with the uh, PCIe uh, solid state drives failing. And I've had memory, um, uh, a memory uh, module fail at those cold temperatures as well. So it's not um, entirely fault free, but um, not so much a design problem with Lenovo. Now, as far as the software goes, I use the Argo software. And um, this uh, was originally designed for uh, very low speed digital type modulation uh, and communication, but it works really well for meteor trails uh, type reflection. Basically what it is, is a, very, very narrow band hor uh, horizontal waterfall. And um, it, I'll, I'll take a few minutes to explain how this uh, works because not everybody uses Argo and just looking at the picture doesn't mean a whole lot. So um, up here in the upper left-hand corner of the, uh, of the Argo window is uh, the time and date when the image ends. So when you archive these, this date tells you uh, at the end of the image here on the far right. Now this, uh, these lines that you see slanting through uh, the waterfall and wandering through are spurious signals of unknown origin. So I don't see those uh, often, but um, they do. I do have these signals that wander through and uh, they don't seem to cause a major problem in terms of uh, recognizing the, the real thing I'm looking for, which are meteor trail reflections. And, and I also use this for aurora uh, radio reflections. Um, so uh, down here on the bottom uh, horizontal scale are the stop time stamps at one minute intervals. So you can see those uh, down here. And then over here on the far right hand side is the frequency scale. And I, uh, I have it set from 980 to 1020 Hertz. Now what this is actually showing you then is the demodulated audio from the receiver. So the, in, in this uh, case, this line, this horizontal line right here in the middle is at about 1000 Hertz. And that's because I had my receiver tuned to 15.001 megahertz. And I have it in the lower sideband mode. So it demodulates the carrier to 1000 Hertz. So what you're seeing is uh, the de demodulated uh, representation of the 15 megahertz carrier from uh, WWV. 
And that's shown here in, as the trace in the middle. Now, <clears throat> in this particular image, you can see some long dur duration meteor trail reflections with bifurcations. So here's one long duration uh, meteor trail reflection here that lasts oh, about uh, uh, one to three minutes. And you can see that the, there are bifurcations here, uh, horizontal bifurcations or striations uh, in that echo. And then these blips that you're seeing here are short duration meteor trail reflections. And there's some Doppler shifting going on here. Um, they're very short duration, so, so they don't, uh, they, they show up as just real short blips. Now the, uh, the horizontal time resolution is, is not all that great with Argo. So um, you'll see these things, you can't uh, really measure their, their time length uh, because of that. So that's a, um, a rundown on the Argo software, which I use ex exclusively. Now, when I uh, went through my 2020 data, uh, there's uh, Argo pro produces about 43,000 images um, every year. Uh, the each image is about 12 or 13 minutes long, and you can do the do the arithmetic on that. It works out to be around 40 plus thousand images. So in 2020 or in 2021, I went back and looked through every one of those to see uh, what was going on in terms of meteor trail reflections and, and actually discover a lot of other stuff too, including aurora uh, radio reflections. So now we, we're getting to the, to the uh, part that I think is most interesting. Um, the, all the, the observations that I'm talking about here are, are from 2020. Um, I still see uh, a lot of, uh, even uh, over the last several weeks, there's been a lot of meteor trail reflections that I've been seeing in the morning. So this is just a kind of a, a one-year snapshot from my archive. Now, the audio, um, what I hear when there are meteor trail reflections coming in, uh, uh, there's just a one second or less burst of tone uh, or a tone enhancement. And when, I, when there is a stream of, uh, of echoes, it sounds like low speed CW demodulated at a thousand hertz. And it's very melodic. Um, it, it's, it almost sounds musical. So um, it's, it's pleasant to hear. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any recordings. Uh, I guess I've, I've been too mesmerized by the sound to hit the record button on my receivers. Now the short bursts of tone um, have, uh, usually have some Doppler frequency, frequency shift and they have a bell or a multiple bell sound or they sound like a wind chime. So um, uh, depending on whether they're short duration or long duration or whatever, uh, the, the sound is actually quite uh, pleasant to listen to. Now, the detections that, that I see um, mostly are around four in the morning local time to 9 a.m. And uh, that is the, the ideal or the, uh, uh, the time of highest probability of actually receiving these types of reflections as shown by that, uh, that uh, earth representation that I uh, am showing in the upper right-hand corner here. A there's a, a, a propagation, a favorable propagation window of about uh, uh, up to three hours. It's not always three hours long. Uh, it could be slightly more, but it usually is less than that. Uh, and it's generally before sunrise at Anchorage. Now that really applies to winter time. Uh, in the summertime in Anchorage, uh, there's not a the, the sunset doesn't last very long. Uh, maybe a, uh, at most uh, about five and a half hours of official sunset, but the sky is still light uh, in the summertime. But um, I, I have very few detections outside the morning time frame. And I, I have seen some uh, on my Argo traces. They may be anomalous. In other words, they may be something other than meteor trail reflections. 
Now, the reflection events that, that I saw in 2020 uh, occurred in all months of, uh, of the year, but not every day of the year. So there was uh, many, many days actually when there were no meteor trail reflections recorded at all. June 2020 produced a few records while January and October produced, produced many records. And that may have something to do with um, uh, the uh, length of the day or something like that maybe. Now the, um, the low detection rate in the months probably was due to unfavorable propagation conditions. In other words, those signals that originated 4,000 kilometers away may not have been able to, to reach Anchorage because of poor propagation. And um, if they're not going to reach Anchorage, then they're probably not going to reach meteor trails uh, for reflection back to uh, or down to Anchorage. Now, I noticed that the number of detected echoes um, always decreased as the propagation improved with the morning ionosphere development. In other words, the sun, the sun would, uh, would start rising along the path from, say, WWV, uh, east of Anchorage. And um, as the sun moved over uh, to illuminate Anchorage, then that's when the propagation would end and um, or sort shortly after that it would end and then I wouldn't see any more echoes after that. Now the um, I mentioned earlier that when I do see these reflections I can't differentiate between WWV and WWVH um, but I do have I did capture one reflection, I, I believe it was late December, right after I installed an R8600 and tuned it to 25 megahertz. Now, 25 megahertz um, in the US is only transmitted by WWV in Colorado. So I knew in that case that the origination point was, was WWV. Now, the Argo spectra um, usually shows a direct path um, as well as an echo path. Now, the, by direct path, I don't mean that um, the radio wave is coming directly to Anchorage. Uh, I mean that it is being reflected or refracted uh, off the ionosphere uh, on its way to Anchorage, but it's it's going it's it's a non-reflected path, and I'm calling that a direct path. Now, usually the echoes um, are 10 to 20 dB above background, so there's quite a signal enhancement. Uh, when I see these uh, echoes being recorded. The Doppler frequency shift that I'm seeing uh, is in the 5 to 10 hertz range, uh, plus or minus 5 to plus or minus 10 hertz. I, there are some exceptions uh, where I see a Doppler shift, Doppler frequency shift of plus or minus 20 hertz, but um, my Argo setup only um, allows uh, or, only, or only shows a 20 hertz, plus or minus 20 hertz uh, frequency bandwidth. So uh, if those uh, Doppler shifts are beyond that, then I don't capture that. So I can't say that I've, that I've seen them. Sometimes the Doppler shifts favor one polarity over another. another. In other words, um, looking at this uh, chart down below, you'll notice that there are more, uh, there's a lot more activity uh, below the uh, carrier trace or the de demodulated carrier trace than there is above. So uh, this would be a, a, a negative shift. Um, now, remember, I'm using lower sideband. My uh, receiver is turned a, a kilohertz, tuned a kilohertz above the carrier. Uh, but I do notice that uh, sometimes these these are uh, they favor a negative shift or a positive shift. Now the short duration echoes appear as a tick or a blip on the Argo waterfall, and um, I I think that these correspond to what are called underdense trails. This this is a uh, where the uh, the meteor trail 
has a, a density below some threshold. And um, the short duration echoes that I see is the vast majority of echoes that, uh, that, are, that I'm detected. They last from a fraction to a few seconds. Uh, I've had streams lasting up to two hours. So here's a, this uh, image down below shows a 106 minute stream of short duration echoes. That's these uh, vertical blips that you see here. Now, when I, when I process these um, Argo images, sometimes uh, because the, the Doppler shift is not very, it's maybe a few hertz, maybe five hertz or so, what I'll do is I'll stretch the image vertically. And that, uh, uh, that kind of processing brings out um, the short duration echoes much better. Now, the long duration echoes, I think, probably correspond to what are called the overdense trails, uh, where that's where the electron density is above some threshold. Um, and almost exclusively, these long duration echoes will show stripes or striations, as shown here in this seven minute long echo uh, in the lower right. Now, uh, this, this particular one is the longest that I've recorded in 2020. Um, that's uh, seven minutes. Uh, a lot of them are maybe a fraction of a minute, maybe uh, 30 seconds or a minute or two. Now, these striations, uh, I, I, I did some thinking about that. Uh, I didn't come to any hard conclusion. But I did make up a list of possible causes. Um, the striations could be called caused by high altitude wind shear, uh, possibly interference between reflected radio waves from different parts of the trail itself, multiple trails produced by a meteor group, or meteor fragmentation, where uh, uh, the meteor has broken apart and now caused its own trail and its own reflection. And they they uh, uh, travel more or less in a group. Um, so you can see on the on the right here, uh, there are multiple striations for this particular uh, echo. So now uh, let's look at some uh, full size charts. This is a 15 megahertz chart. And again, remember that I have my receiver tuned uh, one kilohertz above. 15 megahertz, and uh, so that demodulates, and I'm in lower sideband mode, so that demodulates to a, a, the carrier demodulates to a thousand hertz tone. And so you can see what I call the direct path is this horizontal line here. And then we have um, a, a long duration echo. This one lasts maybe three, maybe three and a half minutes with uh, a lot of striations to it. And then there are some short duration uh, echoes that also show up here, as well as an interloper uh, that just wanders through uh, the spectrum of the horizontal water waterfall. This one um, was uh, from the 1st of January, 2020. Now here's a uh, composite of two 12 minute periods uh, that I spliced together. And this is on the 2nd of January. And you can see there's a lot of activity going on here. There's a lot of short duration echoes. There's all these little blips that you see here. As, uh, and then there's this bulb and uh, some striations from a long duration echo. So again, this is at 15 megahertz. Uh, most of, most of the um, uh, records that, I, that I'm going to show you are from 15 megahertz. Here's another one uh, at 15 megahertz. Here's a nice uh, long duration echo. It lasts approximately a minute. And there's one, two, three, four, five, maybe six striations to that. Um, pretty interesting. I, I showed you the, the laundry list of possible causes. Um, I wish I really knew what, what was causing that. And it could be different things for different echoes. Here are some uh, long duration echoes uh, in two spliced images from Argo. And these are from the 14th of January. And we show uh, at least three long duration. 
here's uh, the first one here. And then we have another one here. You notice there are some, cur some curves up here at the, uh, the beginning of this particular long, long duration echo. And then here's another one here with kind of a bulb uh, followed by stri striations. So that's a, a long duration. And there's uh, some short duration activity going on here as well. <clears throat> and notice too that um, just about everything that shows up in this particular record has a negative uh, frequency shift to it. Uh, in other words, they're below the, uh, the demodulated carrier at a thousand hertz. Now that might have something to do with the direction of the uh, of the echo or, or the meteor trail with respect to Earth. Um, I'm not real sure about that. Here's uh, six six images that I spliced together. So this shows a um, a 73 minute total uh, stream uh, over an hour stream of short duration echoes. And uh, I've stretched this vertically to enhance um, uh, the, the Doppler shift of, uh, of the short duration echoes to, to make them easier to, to recognize. And you can see there's just uh, literally hundreds of them uh, in this 73 minute record. The peak shift is about uh, plus six Hertz for this one. Um, there's, there are some long duration reflections in this record. Here's one over here on the left. Um, here's another one over uh, toward the right uh, that you can see. So it's not always just short or not always just long. It's almost always a, a combination of the two. Here's um, uh, the seven minute, the long duration echo that I, that I captured. This is the longest one in 2020. And now you can see the beginning of it uh, over here, uh, just left of middle, and then all of these striations. Now this, uh, this area right here that are, that's showing horizontal stripes uh, that are evenly spaced in frequency. Now, I don't know if those are a receiver artifact or if they're part of uh, the actual meteor trail reflection themselves. I do see the this type of a signature um, when I'm not receiving any echoes. I occasionally see it. So this may be something going on with the receiver or maybe the audio processing, the signal processing or something like that. But um, most of this is a bona fide reflection and um, at, at 15 megahertz. Now here's a, uh, another indication that shows a uh, uh, long duration echo at 25 megahertz. So what I did is I had my receiver tuned here uh, to 25.000990 uh, megahertz. So that demodulates the 25 megahertz uh, carrier demodulates to 990 hertz on the graph. And you can see that uh, this is um, uh, all, all of uh, a 12 minute record and there's a, long, a nice long duration echo. And this was on the 21st of December, like maybe a day or two after I installed uh, an RA8600 and tuned it to 25 megahertz. You can also see uh, what I call the direct path at 15 megahertz, um, at a, a demodulated to 1,000 hertz on the chart. And um, you'll notice that there aren't any meteor trails at all at 15 megahertz. And then there's also this spurious signal, this horizontal line at the top. Um, it's much thinner than uh, the actual received signals. So it, it definitely is spurious. Um, where it came from, I have no idea. I see those once in a while, but um, uh, this is really the, the one that's important down here at 25 megahertz. Okay, so as far as conclusions go, uh, 
it's definitely possible to use WWV and WWVH for meteor trail uh, reflection work. Uh, I've detected them at Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, both of these uh, transmitter locations are about 4,000 kilometers away. The, the demodulated audio consists of short tone bursts or tone enhancements. Some sound like a bell or a wind chime. Uh, they're all very melodic. The long duration bursts have a wavering tone if the uh, Doppler frequency, frequency shift is more than a few hertz. Now, generally, you, um, it's hard to uh, recognize Doppler frequency shift of, of maybe one, two, or maybe even five hertz. But um, uh, if it's a wavering tone, then you can pick it out of the audio. I've seen Doppler shifts of 10 hertz um, with some exceptional echoes reaching higher values. And when I have a, a large number or a stream of short duration deck echoes, they generally favored one frequency shift polarity. I can't explain that, but uh, it does show up on the charts. Now, the reflections uh, showed an increase of uh, 20, 10 to 20 dB over the background noise level as measured by Argo. Um, so you can put your mouse anywhere on Argo and measure the background noise or put it over a a signal trace and measure um, the, um, and it's in dB uh, with respect to full scale. So it doesn't give you the uh, absolute power level, it gives you a relative power level. Now, almost all duration, uh, all detections occurred between four and nine o'clock local time, local solar, solar time. Um, and it's limited more by the propagation conditions than by the number of meteor trails. In other words, there's meteor trails that are probably occurring all the time, but uh, in terms of my reception of them, I only see them in the mornings. Um, short duration echo streams can last up to two hours uh, in my records, and individual long duration echoes uh, up to seven minutes were observed. So that's pretty much all I've got. Um, I, um, I've i got a, a list of reference, references here, and I just want to speak about this for one second. Now, the, the, the so-called Bible of meteor science and engineering is the book by McKinley that's shown down here. It was published in, uh, my copy of it was published in 1961, and it indeed does have a lot of information about meteors. Uh, both optical and uh, there's a, a radio as well. But I found that the other references here, uh, the Meteor Burst Communications uh, books by Goodman and Shanker and uh, the Radio Propagation by Reflection from Meteor Trails paper had actually much better radio information in them than uh, the McKinley book. So if you um, are thinking about tackling this type of uh, radio work, then uh, certainly um, the, the McKinley book is a good one to have. Uh, they're really cheap on the used market, uh, but also try to get some of these other uh, books and papers that I'm showing here, because <clears throat> I think that they were actually much better for the uh, radio work. Now, the... Um, I mentioned earlier that the, that I wrote a paper about this, and it was published in the SARA proceedings for the uh, conference that I went to last year, or uh, actually in 2021. And uh, these are online. Um, the paper itself uh, is um, is online, and then there's also some uh, uh, another shorter paper on meteor trail reflections that I published, and they're all on my website. And so if you go to these addresses here, you can download um, these papers. Now, I, I uh, upload my Argo images. Every 12 minutes, a new one appears on my website. And so you can go to uh, reeve.com slash meteor slash uh, meteor underscore simple. And you can uh, see these uh, uh, Argo plots in real time. So if uh, anybody needs those addresses, I can put them in the chat box. 
And uh, that's it, the end. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, absorbing and fascinating. Um, uh, there are quite a few questions coming up on the uh, chat chat stream. And if yeah, anybody I, would like to ask a question, please yeah, unmute I'm, yourself. I, I'm I'm uh, uh, paging through them right now. OK, um, um, I'll just pick up a, just before you, you pick up on them. Several people are asking for the presentation to be made available. Um, there's two answers to that. One is the recording of this session in its entirety will be made available through the BAA website, britastro.org. Um, so you can download it and watch it again. Um, as for whether your presentation on its own it will be available, I'll leave that to, to you to answer. Yeah, I can I can make a PDF of the presentation itself, but I I think um, if you're really interested in in uh, uh, the detail or or more detail, then you'd probably want to download the paper um, that I listed there. Now, and the reason is is because everything that I show in the presentation also is in the paper, um, and but the paper has a lot more uh, detail in it as well. And I, I see that most of the questions are are about the presentation. Uh, I'll be glad to. Uh, what I could do is I can uh, make a PDF of it, and then e should I email it to you for uh, distribution, or how do you want to handle that? I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Paul and I can sort that out between us. Okay, good. I'll I'll uh, plan on doing that, and hopefully before the end of today, I'll have a PDF headed your direction. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, questions. Um, have you got them in front of you, Wit, or do you want me to read read? I'll read them out for everybody who's not perhaps looking at the the text. Um, have you seen any long delay echoes during increases in meteor activity? Oh, the uh, long delay, uh, long delay echoes. You know that's interesting because um, uh, that is something that popped up uh, on another project that I'm working on this this just this morning. Uh, and the answer is no. That I uh, if they if I am seeing any long duration echoes, I'm not recognizing them. So um, so I guess the answer is is no. I'm not seeing that. I, and but I haven't really been looking, so uh, maybe that's something that I'll be working on this year. Okay, um, somebody shares a useful tip that you can control the um, downloads and the installation of downloads in Windows 10 Pro, but not in Windows 10 Home, which is a nuisance because that's what I have. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've got Windows 10 under control. I I what I did is I went into my group policy policy settings in Windows 10 and uh, took control of as much as I could, and uh, I froze the um, the updates. But there are some updates that that Microsoft is going to do whether you want them or not. I, I just can't figure out a way to. To, to stop some of them, but like every six months or so, I see something like that pop up, which is not that bad, really. Um, got a question. Can you say a few words about auroral reflections? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I noticed one day, I just happened to be sitting in front of the monitor and I had both my SAM-3 magnetometer uh, magnetogram up on the screen as well as my Argo uh, up on the same screen. And I noticed the uh, a really fast deflection on the magnetometer. At the same time, I was seeing a lot of anomalous activity on Argo. And so I went back and looked at my data, and uh, lo and behold, I made a correlation with uh, uh, magnetic activity with uh, the aurora reflections and wrote a paper about it. And it's also on my website. Um, so uh, just to put in uh, aurora radio reflections and my name, 
and you you'll probably be able to get to that paper right away. Um, it's on the same scale. In other words, it's a, probably a 20 or 30 page paper as the uh, meteor trail reflections. So yeah, very, very interesting. And uh, um, I discovered them uh, just by accident. And next, um, Tracy Harty re reflects that and confirms she sees more echoes from Graves radar in in the morning. So you know the and promises to go back over her record. So the, those observations, and I think which I think the visual observers see the same thing, standing up and confirmed. Um, I th yes, thank you very much for the. Uh, Note on updates, Diane. I did like calamity updates. <laughs> and somebody says, "What about Linux?" Ah, uh, what about Linux? Um, <laughs> yeah, what about Linux? Uh, yeah, that question always comes up. Um, I can't answer that because I don't use Linux except on Raspberry Pi, and um, uh, I don't believe that there is an Argo or I, or equivalent to Argo that runs on Linux, but I'm not sure about that. I can't really speak to that. Uh, so there's somebody now asking for some information about the Argo software itself, which I'd, I'd join in with because I've not heard um, of it. Oh yeah, um, uh, yeah, Argo, um, I think, the best uh, I can I can send I, I can uh, send you a link to Argo software. Um, it's an old program, but it's still available and still works. And um, uh, the way you can find it, I believe, is by uh, doing the search terms of Argo software meteor. Um, or radio, and th that'll get you to uh, the correct website. I can't remember the fellow's name that developed the software, but um, uh, it is still available online, or the last time I checked it was. Okay, somebody has just posted a link to the Argo software website into the chat. So uh, feel free to copy that across. Um, okay, a question good. about gamma ray bursts. Yes, there was a big, exciting gamma ray burst on October the 9th, which I think a lot of us saw as an uh, ionospheric disturbance at very low frequencies. Did you see anything in your observations associated with that? No, I, I did not. And I did go back to and look uh, to see if there was anything, and I didn't find anything that was that I could say was for sure associated with that event. Okay, any more questions? Uh, Does anyone yeah. want to chime in? Uh, yes. I'd like to ask a question. Okay. Um, very interesting, Wit. I really enjoyed your talk. And you raised a number of uh, questions where, you, you know, interpretation. So it sounds like there's plenty of research to be done there. Uh, the question I've got is, um, it's uh, by static um, uh, communication that you're talking about. And uh, by static um, reflections, um, they, are, they mirror about the, the central point. Uh, so the question is, how can you tell whether the meteors are close to you or close to the transmitter? I don't think that I can, um, because I, I don't know of, I don't have any information on the angles involved. And I think that I would need to know that uh, to, to, uh, de to determine whether they're close to the transmitter or the receiver. I'm assuming that they're close to the receiver because um, uh, the argument I would make is that if they were close to the transmitter, uh, the reflection is going to be uh, somewhat weak, and then it then it has to propagate four thousand kilometers to Anchorage. So um, 
which would which I could argue, I guess, would would preclude me receiving them. So that's why I'm assuming they're they're closer to Alaska than they are to Colorado or Hawaii. All right. Um, Ter Terence, you had a question. Yes, I was going to ask, um, how directional are the reflections? I mean, what I mean is um, if you were receiving a reflection on your receiver and I was, say, five miles, 50 miles, 100 miles away, would I expect to receive them as well? Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. And <clears throat> I don't, if you were real close to me, I would say probably you would receive the same reflections. But I do know that... Um, uh, I correspond with Stan Nelson in, in New Mexico about this uh, quite often. He never sees the same ones I see. Of course, he's way, way down there. Um, uh, so if you're five miles away from me, um, I would say probably. You, you would probably see the same reflections that I do. If you're 100 miles away from me, um, I don't know. I don't think so. So... <laughs> Uh, and I'm just guessing at that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we now have a question about space junk. And I think this may relate to your, your spurious signals that wander across the screen in a nice diagonal line. I was wondering if they were uh, airplanes. Oh, um, yeah, those spurious signals. Um, they they are usually when I see spurious signals, they last for a long time. In other words, uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes or more. And if I um, here recently, I've been I have I've, I'm operating another receiver and I'm I have its bandwidth uh, visible uh, displayed bandwidth. Uh, up to plus or minus 200 hertz. And so I'll see um, something drift through my Argo and simultaneously it'll drift through my other receiver, but it keeps on going. So in other words, it's not, it couldn't be an airplane because it, it lasts far too long for an airplane. But um, the source, uh, boy, I sure don't know. It could be um, some wayward power supply um, in my observatory. Uh, it could be anything. So no, I don't know what the mm. uh, what the source is. Uh, somebody suggested the ISS. the The source could be the ISS. Okay. Are there any more questions? Can I have one very brief one, slightly off, off topic, Wit? Um, there was a bit in the newspapers, and I, which I followed up to a Finnish academic paper about audio sounds from auroras. And they've you know, demonstrated that they are real, and they've demonstrated a mecha mechanisms that would produce them and cause them to be distinctly audible at ground level. Is it something you've, you've ever heard? Yes. Um... And this has always been pretty controversial, but I, I do know uh, when I was going to college in, in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, um, it's in, in the interior um, of Alaska, and we, almost every night, uh, clear night, you'd have aurora. And I, I can remember standing... Um, out in an extremely quiet area and hearing a clicking noise that seemed to correlate with the movement of the aurora that I was watching. So I, I, I think I, I heard it at least in my mind's ear. And, um, uh, but I, it, you couldn't tell or I couldn't tell where it was coming from. So I, I do really think that that there are sounds and people have heard the sounds. And I, I uh, think that the paper you're, you're, you're referring to is, I think I've seen that and it all sounded pretty plausible to me. I've just popped a link in it for anybody who's interested. It, it is in English and it's from Alto University in Finland. 
Espoo, I think is the, the, the town it's situated in. Okay, if there are no more questions, there I... is there is another there is question. another question. Ah. One more. Uh, okay, uh, I once read Level. that meteor meteors can trigger lightning. Is that true? Yeah, I don't know. I I hadn't heard that, um, but no, I don't I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I'm going to make that the last question because otherwise Brian won't get his time slot and we'll still be here sometime tomorrow because this is so right. interesting. Okay, okay. well, thank, thanks very much and happy new year. Yes, thank you very much, Wit. That was terrific. Um, Brian, are you there? Yes, hopefully I am. And uh, thanks, Wit. That was a great presentation. Very good. Thank okay, the, the screen is yours, Brian, if you want it. Okay, I'm going to try to share uh, screen two and uh, who knows what's going to happen. We have a screen share from you. Okay, great. Well, that looks as if we can get started. Um, I think most of you, uh, certainly in the UK, will be aware that we built, we've built a, um, a beacon operating on 50.408 megahertz and located it at a reasonably central location in the UK, courtesy of the Mansfield and Sutton Astronomical Society. And it's been cheerfully transmitting away for uh, since the 14th of May, in fact. Uh, if you go to ukmeteorbeacon.org, um, you'll find our website and uh, slash B status, well, you'll find it on the menu. You can see the actual live status of the uh, of the beacon. It's running around about 75 watts to a, a pair of Moxon antennas beaming vertically upwards with right hand circular polarization. And uh, if you wonder what the dump power is, the uh, um, a hybrid splitter is used to generate the, the phase shift for the um, circular polarization and the dump port. Uh, as long as the power on that is relatively low, it shows the antennas should be working uh, reasonably well. Now, um, anyone in, within about a thousand kilometers of Mansfield using whatever receiver they've got should be able to monitor the, uh, the beacon. I think the, the usual um, bane of all uh, astronomers, radio astronomers, is local noise. And as we know, at 50 megahertz, uh, uh, local noise can be a major problem. And we're looking to overcome that problem, as I'll explain uh, a little later on in the presentation. Uh, my preferred way of monitoring the uh, beacon is using a software defined radio, and I use an RSP DX uh, with uh, using SDR console uh, to provide a display. And this is only really during the development phase of the project, because we're going to be developing our own receivers and the display formats will be um, left flexible for uh, people to choose what they want, when, whether it be Spectrum Lab or what have you. But a very key feature of, of Meteor Echoes that uh, observed at 50 megahertz uh, is, in my view, what I call the head echo. I don't know if you can see it, this horizontal line. That's the bit where the meteor is uh, burning up creating very intense radiation, and if you like, leaving a, a, um, a wire-like um, structure which reflects uh, radio uh, signals. Um, the tail echo, which I think people refer to as the overdense echo, if it exists, um, I regard as coming from a region that the, the meteor has passed through and caused it to become more sufficiently ionized to reflect radio uh, the frequency in question. Um, one thing I'd like to um, um, touch on, with um, uh, which was made very clear by, which is the great difference between the way the ionosphere behaves at different wavelengths. And uh, it behaves very differently um, at 50 megahertz to 15 megahertz and also to 143 megahertz, where, where people are looking at the graves echoes. And I think mostly uh, the, the graves echoes that we see here in, in the UK 
are all virtually head echoes. T the, the tails are <clears throat> less common because they require a higher electron density at 143 megs. <coughs> This is a screenshot showing the, a, um, a meteor event. Uh, in this case, the span of the waterfall display, and you note I'm using vertical waterfall, and the span of the head echo, sorry, the span of the display is plus and minus one and a half kilohertz in this particular shot. And the, uh, the start of the head echo is with a positive Doppler shift of about a kilohertz and a, um, it ends with a negative Doppler shift of around 400 hertz. <coughs> you may think I'm rather obsessed with head echoes, but hopefully I'll explain why in a moment. There are a number of phenomena that can cause regions of the ionosphere to become reflective to radio at 50 megs, and not all are directly related to meteor events. And I think some confusion has arisen here um, and uh, probably the next slide you might find slightly controversial. One of the phenomena is known as sporadic E, and it has a number of causes, and it's not necessarily linked to specific meteor events. We can be sure that the echo we're seeing is due to a meteor if we see the head echo with its characteristic rapidly changing Doppler shift. But there's a problem. Head echoes may be directional and polarised, which means that not all observers will see a head echo. Um, it's behaving like a wire, the head echo, and we know how wires energised with uh, radio frequency behave. They produce lobes and nulls, and uh, they are also likely to be polarised. At the risk of being very controversial, uh, this is a spectrogram taken from page nine of the Brahms Meteo report. Um, and it shows a number of what they describe as um, under dense echoes, the aircraft echoes are the wavy lines here. And then they call this an over dense echo. Sorry, I'm going to be very controversial. I and a number of other people who are reasonably experienced with radio propagation do not think that's a meteor echo. We think it's a case of sporadic E. It lacks the sharp edge um, at the beginning. Uh, it, there may be some uh, additional underdense echoes in this region here, but the, the overall cause, I, I put it to you, is not an individual meteor event. So this is why I'm particularly obsessed and interested with head echoes. Um, now, it's important that we extract as much information as possible from the echoes we observe, and uh, we, we aim to extract um, the, particularly the extent of the Doppler and the, and the peak brightness, um, and for tail echoes, the brightness, the spectral spread, and the Doppler shift, if any. The, the tail echoes may have Doppler shift due to wind at the altitude of the region that's become reflective. If some observers do not see a head echo for a particular event, while others do, that is of interest to this project, very, very much so. So, <clears throat> phase one of the project was to build the receiver. That's been established and is working, uh, uh, it's been working well. Um, the phase two is to design uh, receivers specifically to receive the beacon. Um, and to build and deploy these to a variety of radio quiet locations to form what in effect is a bi-static radar system. These locations will be chosen to provide the best geometric view of events in the area that's illuminated by the beacon. And sites between 400 and kilometers and 1,000 kilometers from the beacon will be particularly valuable as these, if at that, that distance aircraft reflections are um, pretty much eliminated. <clears throat> so this is the concept. The beacon uh, illuminates the uh, region um, at 80 to 100 kilometers. Um, we deploy receivers uh, 
to as many locations as we can. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, and we link them, ultimately, the objection is to link them through a central server system. Um, but while, while the system is under development, we are hoping that these receivers will be accessible by those wishing to contribute to the, con the project by making their own observations and, and, and feeding their ideas and thoughts into the, uh, into the pro project, particularly with regard to how we're going to analyze uh, the data. Um, this is a block diagram of the receiver as we currently envisage it, and I have one operating in my, uh, uh, in my radio room at the moment, um, but there's a lot more work to do yet. Basically, an SDR uh, receiver, software-defined receiver, we, we're at the moment looking at the RSPDX because we have become familiar with it and the manufacturers have been helpful to us as we need to get inside its uh, in a soul and uh, um, understand it very clearly. This will be linked to a Raspberry Pi. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> we, we require precision timing and we require the frequency stability to be a, of a high standard. So for that reason, we have a, a, a GPS subsystem, if you like, which currently consists of two units. One is a Leo Bodnar frequency reference which generates 24 megahertz that is required by the uh, rspdx to lock it on frequency we also use the 24 megahertz into another unit which has got a another gps receiver one of the cheap and cheerful u-blocks type receivers and a, a and a synthesizer and that synthesizer and the u-blocks the, the u-blocks unit produces a one second pulse, the leading edge of which is synchronous with UTC to within a, a few microseconds. And the, um, <clears throat> uh, the uh, synthesizer generates a frequency that's going to be in band with our, the signals that we want. Uh, in, in, at present, we're, 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 we put it at 54 point, sorry, 50.406, so two kilohertz away from the beacon. And we generate timing pulses, which are injected into the front end of the receiver. It might sound a little odd at first sight, but what we're trying to do is to compensate for the latency through the receiver, as well as across the internet to the server. The, oh, yes. The receiver also, um, uh, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on, on, on the timing in, in just a moment. So here is a, an example of the um, pulses being injected into the front end of the receiver. They are used also to encrypt uh, over a period of mi a minute, um, the date, the time, and uh, a, a, a station ID for the particular receiver. The one minute marker is a longer pulse and the other 59 pulses vary in length to encrypt the, the rest of the data. Um, we are looking to get a, 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 a timing precision of the order of, well, 100 microseconds would be nice. And you might ask the first question, well, uh, how are you going to get any accuracy with 100 microsecond timing? And uh, the first thing you have to put out of your mind is the speed of light. We're not interested in the speed of light. We're interested in the speed of the meteor, which luckily is, what, four, four or more orders of magnitudes slower so the timing precision therefore is 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 not uh, uh, is not so uh, great so how how do we propose to do this and i have to say quite frankly <clears throat> that we're not quite sure yet but this diagram a very simplified two-dimensional diagram gives you some clues as to how the thinking is working uh, over here we've got the transmitter here we've got the path of the of, of a meteor and we've got a receiver over here, a receiver over here, and a receiver over here. And the Doppler shift observed by any particular receiver is going to be a function of the uh, rate of change of the path from the meteor to the transmitter and the rate of change of path length to the receiver. Um, and uh, 
by having a sufficient number of receivers with a suitable geometry and, and think here about um, the geometry required for GPS, for example, in your GDOPs and so forth, we will need to establish a network of receivers um, uh, with a sufficient number of them that we can get a sufficiently price, precise uh, measurement of Doppler shift at an instant of time. Uh, we are not expecting to be able to do this in real time, of course. The idea is that the data will be streamed in more or less IQ audio format to a server and uh, a, an event trigger will be, or event recording will be triggered uh, when one or more of the receivers sees a head echo. And we will then establish uh, a common period when the head echo is visible from each of the or as many receivers as possible. And then one can start the calculation to, tri um, to triangulate the beacon, the meteor to calculate its uh, origin, its trajectory, etc. <clears throat> And we will be looking for help to do this, I hasten to add. In the meantime, it would be very helpful if anybody with suitable receiving equipment could monitor uh, the beacon and take screenshots of interesting echoes. This will add to our knowledge base and help us to design an automated analysis system in the future. And screenshots can be posted on the beacon website, Spectrogram Gallery. Uh, which is you can find at the ukmeteorbeacon.org uh, uh, website. We see all sorts of interesting echoes. Uh, <clears throat> here's one uh, where I have reduced the span here to plus and minus 100 hertz, which is more in line with what the Brands folk were doing. Um, but their system and their filtering uh, doesn't show the head echo. In this one, it's terribly faint, I know. And that's partly a function of the, of the uh, SDR processing, which we, we're working on. But it starts here at, um, I'm not quite sure what that is. It's certainly minus 90 hertz or so. It goes to plus, I don't know, probably to 200 hertz, something like that. And the what I call the tail echo, what some people seem to refer to as the overdense uh, um, echo, you see it has a very sharply defined um, uh, start, which is coincident with the head echo. Okay, I think that really tells you re uh, 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 about as much as I can say about where the system is. We are currently working on the design of the receiver and currently working on the format for um, streaming the data. Uh, this is under discussion. There are several ways of we can go about it. And they're mostly, um, uh, or, or, the, or the main challenge is to overcome the uh, latency through the receiver itself and especially across the internet. Um, so there we are, that's about it. Brian, thank you very much for the update. Um, there are a couple of questions turned up in the, the chat stream while you were speaking. Um, question about the software. Um, you're using console as opposed to SDR play. Is there a rationale behind that choice or it just happened that way? It more or less just happened that way. And being a lazy person, uh, I actually got on a lot better with SDR console than I did with SDR play. Uh, I did, I did try there. I've tried various ones and SDR console I found most, I was most comfortable with, but I hasten to add that, uh, it, it, ultimately we don't want to tie anyone to a particular um, particular software. Uh, we will be streaming IQ, or essentially audio data, which anybody can access and do with whatever they, they wish. Okay, I'll come back to the next question. Um, there's a question about the licensing for the transmitter. Um, I, I think that was a story that you, you did tell before, but just to just to repeat it briefly for those who missed the <laughs> missed the pre previous presentation. Yes, well, it's there are lots of amateur radio beacons around for, for propagation purposes. Sorry, somebody else will pick this up in, um, in a few seconds with any luck. Um, I, they, they will pick it up. <laughs> they have done. <laughs> 
Sorry about that. Yeah, the, the, um, there are a lot of propagation beacons around in the world of amateur radio, but they normally beam horizontally. They don't aim to illuminate the sky. So uh, asking for a license to, to beam up into the sky is slightly different. The other thing is propagation beacons are generally relatively low power compared to our, uh, our 75 watts that we're beaming upwards. So a certain amount of uh, care had to be taken in applying to our authority, Ofcom, to get a licence. But with the help of the Radio Society of Great Britain uh, and some supporting letters from uh, the BAA, uh, um, a licence was duly forthcoming. OK. Um, identify the signal. Somebody's asking about how the signal is identified. I think you mentioned that there was encrypted data on the receiver end um is that encrypted data on the transmitter end no uh, uh, the legal requirement is that we identify um the beacon in some means and we buy identify it every few minutes in with uh, simple a1 a morse going as fast as we can because actually any modulation on the signal is a nuisance uh, we'd much rather transmit a, pl a blank carrier because we were going to want to uh, make accurate um, Doppler measurements using it. So um, we reluctantly put, um, <laughs> put the call sign uh, um, every few minutes as fast as we could send it. Uh, but no, no encryption. We're very much against any form of encryption on the transmission because it detracts from the uh, ability to use the precise Doppler measurements. Uh, next question is about antenna types. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. Yes, it seems like an odd choice, and it was to me, but I think it was um, um, uh, the other Paul who, who, who alerted me to the Moxon design. The Moxon design produces a, 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 a about the right beam width that we want as a two element moxon gives you about a plus and minus 60 degree beam width which was about what we wanted to illuminate the the, the patch of sky their construction when they are the, the ends are joined together uh, with a suitable insulating material the construction is very robust much more robust than a um, a normal yagi type antenna which has got lots of elements waving around in the breeze so we were attracted to that and I made the one uh, for the transmitter um, and it was modelled and so on and uh, it, it looks as if it's, um, it's working really well. So it was robust, relatively easy to make and tune and um, uh, that's the answer really. Um, just from a practical point of view, the because the ends are folded round to meet up, um, if you could, could you put the picture of the transmitter back on the, the screen? Yes. It, it, with something mount, mounted quite close to the ground, you've got no sharp ends sticking out for spectators to impale themselves on. Um, it's, and it's smaller. There we go. Yes, it's, it's smaller than a, a, a dipole and reflector and um, much more robust. As I say, no sharp edges. <laughs> Uh, somebody's asking for a DIY guide and post, has posted a link. Thank you very much. Those who are interested can, can follow that through. Are there any more questions? Oh, I've missed one. My apologies, um, Pablo. My apologies. Um, has anyone explored the possibility of WSPR transmissions being reflected by meteor trails? Now, I'm not sure who that's addressed to, possibly WIT. I will happily have a go at it. Generally, WSR um, transmissions are very, very weak, and you need, do need a, a reasonable amount of power to get an echo off a uh, off a meteor. Whisper signal levels tend to be very low. I don't know whether you would agree with that, Wynn. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I was had my uh, microphone turned off, but I no, I don't know of anybody that's actually doing that. Uh, it sounds interesting and. One never knows what might come out of a study like that. So, if uh, if someone wants to volunteer to do that, then I think it would be 
uh, worth looking at. Just one thing, Paul, that I, I forgot to add is that uh, the intention is that once the design of the receiver is complete, uh, we have funding to build uh, about three of them and deploy them. But we're hoping that others will want to build their own and integrate them into the network. So all the software and all the design will be uh, open source. Yes. Um... Next question is a there is a practical question. Is there a ground reflector on the uh, transmit antenna? No, the reflector is the lower element, and uh, if you all the modelling shows that it's uh, um, it, it's fine. The front that's one of the other characteristics of the the Moxon. The front to back ratio is exceptionally large. Okay, next question is about space junk. Um, 50 megahertz goes straight straight through the ionosphere at most times. Would you expect to see space orbital reflections like the space picket fence type systems? I mean, with a wavelength of, um, of six meters, I think we're only going to see large-ish pieces unless they're, uh, unless they're burning up. If they're burning up, then yes, we'll see them. But... Uh, Beyond that, I think uh, they need to be pretty big. I haven't seen any sign of the space station, but I don't think it goes over Mansfield very often. OK, anybody else got a question? If you want to chip in uh, um, by voice, please unmute yourself. Yep, we have another one in the chat room. What's the simplest, best type of receiver antenna to be able to receive the signal? Sorry if this is a silly question. It's most certainly not a silly question. No, de definitely not. It rather depends where you are, your distance from the uh, from the beacon. Uh, if you're within a couple of hundred kilometers of it, then a dipole, a simple wire dipole would be good. Uh, it, and it might be a good idea to point that dipole end on to the beacon to null out the direct signal, because there's going to be a direct signal, and to angle it so that it's pointing roughly to a spot 100 kilometers above Mansfield. Um, but uh, dipoles have been successfully used. Um, e even indoor dipoles have been, been used um, reasonably successfully. If you're within 400 kilometers of the, of the beacon, then um, you're going to see aircraft. If you're from 400 kilometers to greater distance, then I would suggest that you're going to start needing a beam, a Yagi of some sort to get a bit more gain. Okay, um, another one on the chat. Are there similar beacons in existence elsewhere that you know of? Yes, the, the, the closest ones to us are the two in Belgium. In fact, they were kind of the inspiration for doing this. And they are at Brems and they're on uh, one of them is on 49.990, and the other is on 49.970 megahertz. Um, the, the reason we, we're doing our own thing is not because we're, um, uh, we're anti-Belgium, it's because they don't provide much coverage over the UK. We're particularly wanting to provide coverage over the UK, and perhaps ultimately to share our information with the optical uh, meteor monitoring systems that exist in the UK and the, the Belgian beacons wouldn't help us to do that. Um, there's part, uh, questions are piling in. Um, where have we got to? Vertically polarised Moxon pointing towards Man, Mansfield, that would be okay. Horizontal probably is more convenient, but uh, yeah, vertical if you must. It's circular polarization, so polarization shouldn't make any difference. Uh, the only thing I would say there is that the echoes from the, the head echoes probably are polarized. And that's one of the reason why not everybody will see them. And I guess they're likely to be rather more horizontal than they are vertical. Just a thought. So if I'm understanding that, Correctly, Brian. Just looking at your your picture, one antenna is the sort of ob oblong box, sort of si side on to us. Yes. Um, and that is pointing 
pointing vertically. So if yeah. you were wanting to put a receiver antenna in, you would probably want to tip it over slightly so it's pointing to, towards Mansfield. Yes, indeed. If you're if you're within um, a couple of hundred kilometres of Mansfield, it's a good idea to have it horizontal and angled up a bit. That actually helps get rid of some of the local noise. So, um, you okay. by moving the antenna around, you can find a good place and a bad place, even if you're only using a dipole. Um, and by angling the moxon up at an appropriate angle to to, to be pointing at a hundred k above um, Mansfield. You, you, you'd be surprised how I have an electric fence just to the north of me, which is a bit of a nuisance. Um, and when I beam the uh, moxon up, it more or less disappears, which is great. Uh, somebody's asking, I assume that any NNA, I assume that's our, are there any similar um, transmitters in North America? That I don't know. Maybe some of, someone in our audience may have uh, insight into that. I know some people in, in North America are using, um, uh, apparently there are still some old uh, Channel 2 TV stations in Mexico and uh, maybe even up in Canada. So I know that some people in the U.S. are using those stations uh, in the 50 megahertz range for meteor trail type work. <clears throat> and Tom Ashcraft in uh, New Mexico is using uh, some a, a digital station at 50, uh, digital TV station at 50 megahertz. So uh, those are the only ones that I know of. I don't know of any uh, ham uh, amateur radio type uh, beacons like what you guys are, are working on. There are quite a few um, 50 megahertz beacons around the world, but they, they would be propagation beacons beaming generally beaming horizontally and not running a huge amount of power. If you Google uh, beacon spot, I think that's beacon spot um, UK, um, you will find a, uh, a, a web page where you can actually look up, um, I think most of the beacons in the world by band. Um, I think you have to, uh, because it was being hacked such a lot, I think you have to kind of join, but it's completely free. Um, you have to register with it. Uh, and then, then you can find all these beacons. And indeed, um, some of the propagation beacons are used for the purposes of spotting meteors to detect meteor showers for those engaged in what we call meteor scatter communications. Um, but they're not illuminating a, a, a particular region they're uh, beaming horizontally and if any meters get in the way um so be it okay are there any more questions no well thank you brian for a very interesting update on an interesting project and um, we look forward to the the next phase if anyone Fancy's volunteering and assisting with that, please contact Brian directly. I think he'd be delighted to hear from you. I certainly would. Um, just finally, two things. The next monthly talk will be Friday, February the 3rd, when Paul has arranged for Ziri Yunsai to speak on the imaging of black holes with the Event Horizon Telescope, which should be an interesting talk to say that, say the least. Now, on Saturday, the 21st of January, there's an extra event. It's a workshop training center where Wolfgang Hermann from Stockhart Astropelier will be speaking to those who want to attend on how, on a, with a how to do its talk and how to get started in radio astronomy. So for those who are old hands, maybe you would say come in and contribute and for those who are new and those who are interested and those just fancy having a go at something new please join us and finally for those who are completely confused 
I'm Andrew Thomas. It may say I'm Paul Hearn, but Paul is on holiday and he asked me to do the hosting tonight. So, and between us, we both apologise for the uh, the mess over the link earlier on, but uh, we have had a very good audience tonight. So I think most most people obviously found their way around it. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. A pleasure.